Hey, if you've got your Bible, and I hope you do, grab them. Let's open them up to 2 Samuel chapter 2. 2 Samuel 2 is where we are. Uh, if you have a phone or a tablet, you're welcome to open that up to 2 Samuel. There are hardback black Bibles under every chair. 2 Samuel will be on page 255 in those bi Bibles. Uh, if you don't have uh, your own Bible or you've got one that's in a different translation or you know it's written in Old English, gosh, please take that black one with you. It'll be a gift uh, from us to you. But we're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 2 today. As you're getting there, as you're turning to 2 Samuel, uh, I think there are simple things in life that can quickly get rather complicated. Okay, things, things that we understand and we grasp, they're simple uh, until someone starts to ask questions or starts to like poke holes in what we're talking about. Here's an example I thought of this week. Uh, a couple nights ago, we had in my home uh, breakfast for dinner. Breakfast for dinner, okay? Uh, uh, so we had eggs and bacon and toast for dinner, right? Uh, which is awesome. If you, and we're not the only ones who do this, right? Uh, you do this? Okay, good, good, good. Uh, listen, breakfast for dinner, not a big deal for me because I understand what breakfast is. And I understand what dinner is and I understand the difference between them. But I was thinking to myself, how might I explain breakfast for dinner, that concept to, to a two-year-old. How, how would I explain that? Because I fancy myself as an educated man. Um, you know, I, I read books. I, I have multiple degrees. Like, I, I, I mean, I'm pretty smart, I think. Uh, but I couldn't come up with how I would describe breakfast to a two-year-old. Uh, let me explain, okay? Maybe I would start by saying, okay, well, breakfast is the first meal of the day. But, but that's not always true, okay? Because I barely ever ate breakfast when I was in college, okay? Right, I, I mean, I started with lunch, dinner was the second meal, and then it was probably like 1 a.m. where I'd get a chalupa from Taco Bell. And, and you can call that a meal, or you can just call that a bad decision, but it, I rarely ate breakfast. So, so if it's not the first meal of the day, how do I explain it? Well, I thought, okay, if I got a two-year-old here, I would say, well, it's... It's, it's bacon, and it's eggs, and it's cereal, and it's like, wait, 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 we just had that for dinner. <laughs> so if that's not it, so, so I, I, I'm making a point here. Breakfast, the idea of breakfast is very simple until you try to explain it, and then all of a sudden it becomes vastly more complex. Uh, our text is kind of like that today, okay? Uh, it's, it's simple, and it's complicated, it's complicated. That's what I'm calling today's sermon. And, and like I said last week, chapters two through five of 2 Samuel are really one big unit telling very simple events uh, of David leaving the Philistines' territory, making his way back to the promised land, and then ultimately being crowned king over all of Israel. But this takes like seven and a half years. It's, it's, it's a lot longer than just a couple of chapters. And these chapters that cover these events are way obscure. I mean, if you've read ahead, these are wild passages. Uh, they're very underknown, even to Bible readers. So if you're newer to the church and you're just kind of stepping right into this, like you're stepping into some weird stuff. This is just some weird stuff. Um, plus, they're going to bring up some really complicated issues issues that we need to do some work with and deal with. So here's what I'm going to do today. We're going to take a larger chunk of text, okay? Uh, I'm going to summarize some portions of it, and some of it we'll read fully, but we're going to cover the second half of chapter two and the first half of chapter three. So essentially, we're going to cover like a whole chapter. It's just kind of chopped up a little weird, but I think there's some really important stuff. You'll see it. It's complicated. It's complicated. So let's dig in. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 2, we're going to pick it up where we left off last week in verse 12. Look at verse 12. Follow along with me. Abner, the son of Ner, and the servants of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, went out from Mahanaim. Mahanaim. See, these, the, even, even guys with seminary degrees can't say most of the words in the Bible. That should, you should feel good about yourself uh, in this, okay? And they made him king, uh, I'm sorry, verse 12, uh, verse 13. 
Uh, and Joab, the son of Zeruiah, and the servants of David went out and met them at the pool of Gibeon. And they sat down, the one on one side of the pool and the other on the other side of the pool. So real quick, by way of reminder, we've got Abner, the son of Ner. Abner was uh, essentially King Saul's right-hand man and general. He was the commander of Saul's armies. Now Saul is dead, so he has installed Ishbosheth, Saul's fourth and last son, as the new king over the 11 tribes of Israel. There's one tribe hanging out that doesn't follow them, but all 11 tribes follow Ishbosheth. And then we meet Joab. So we've got Abner on one side, and then Joab on the other side. Joab is David's right hand man and commander of his armies. So essentially, we've got Abner versus Joab. The text says that these two men with their armies meet head to head uh, at a pool. And then verses 14 through 17 tell us that Abner chose 12 young men and and Joab chose 12 young men and said, let's let those guys do some fighting, hand-to-hand combat, uh, and whoever wins, wins. So it's kind of a David versus Goliath thing, right? Every uh, every army kind of chooses their champions, sends them out into battle, and whoever wins, wins. But the text will say that 24, these 12 and 12, these 24 young men, all stab each other at the same time. Literally, that's what it says. Uh, and I don't understand how one dude isn't just like, whoa, and, and wins. <laughs> but he doesn't. And all 24 men are killed like at the same time. And there's no clear victor in this skirmish. So an all-out civil war breaks out between Israel and Judah. Remember, Judah is one of the 12 tribes, but the other 11 tribes versus Judah, a civil war breaks out. Abner versus Joab. David, the house of David versus the house of Saul. And that's the war. But then something happens after that battle that will affect what happens next. So we'll skip down to verse 18. Look at verse 18. And the three sons of Zeruiah were there. Joab, Abishai, and Asahel. Now Asahel was as swift on foot as a wild gazelle. Okay, so what we just read is that in this battle, Joab and his two brothers are all fighting together in this battle against uh, against uh, 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 I'm sorry Abner and his team. And it just told us that the youngest brother Asahel is a fast runner. That's essentially the setup. Now look at verses 19. We're going to do a bigger chunk here, 19 through 23. And Asahel pursued Abner, and as he went, he turned neither to the right hand nor to the left from following Abner. Then Abner looked behind him and said, is that you, Asahel? And he said, it is I. Abner said to him, turn aside to your right hand or to your left and seize one of the young men and take his spoil. But Asahel would not turn aside from following him. And Abner said again to Asahel, turn aside from following me. Why should I strike you to the ground? How then could I lift up my face to your brother Joab? Verse 23, but he refused to turn aside. Therefore, Abner struck him in the stomach with the butt of his spear so that the spear came out at his back and he fell there and died where he was. Uh Uh-oh. That's an uh uh-oh moment in the text, okay? What just happened is Abner killed Joab's brother. Now, note that it was in the context of war as he's being chased. So it's not his fault, okay? This is a just killing in the midst of a battle, but this will begin a blood feud which will carry us into next week's text, That's why I read that whole section, because this actually sets up what we're going to see next week in the text. So just store that away in your memory, okay? The butt of the, he did this move, right? And swift like a gazelle got a spear through his gut. Now, in verses 24 through 29, there is a bit more uh, chasing. They keep chasing Abner, Joab's men. They keep chasing. But ultimately, Joab calls off the pursuit of Abner and his men. And this is the beginning of the first civil war in Israel's history, where Judah is up against Israel. But then look at verse 30. Joab returned from the pursuit of Abner, so that skirmish is done. And when he had gathered all the people together, 
there were missing from David's servants 19 men besides Asahel. But the servants of David had struck down of Benjamin 360 of Abner's men. So the first battle is done. And a couple things that I want to point out first. Abner is the aggressor in this entire affair. Abner is the one who's kind of pushing this forward. And that's because this is Abner in his deliberate attempt to impose himself over David's rule and reign in his kingdom. And I said this last week as we talked about the beginning of chapter two, but, but it should be expected for us to see opposition towards the will of God. We should expect opposition uh, towards God's way and towards God's kingdom, like those things we should expect. And so Abner is that force in this text. But then second, while he is the aggressor, Abner is the loser, Like he lost, I mean, sure, he killed Asahel, which is a big deal, but you saw the tally there, right? Uh, Joab lost 19 guys and and Abner lost 360. That's a shellacking, right? That's a slaughter fest. As we will see, um, Abner, he knows what he's doing. He knows that that God has promised David the kingship and he is uh, opposing David. He finds himself in in opposition against the very will of God and he loses badly. So what do we do with this? Weird stuff, right? You glad you came today? I I bet you are. Um, Let me make my first point of application from the text. And it's a question. Are you opposing God? Are you in opposition to God's will? Abner, listen, he knew that God wanted David to be king. He knew God's will and he did the exact opposite. He set himself in opposition against God's will. And church, Abner is not far from any one of us. Like, let the message of Abner preach to you this morning. Let him tell you that it is very possible to know the truth and not embrace the truth. That it's very possible to quote the truth of God's word and not submit to it. That it's very possible to hold to that truth and yet be an aggressor and even assault that truth with how you live. Y'all, it's complicated. It's complicated. I know what I should be doing, but I'm not doing it. You ever say that? I know, I, I know better. That's exactly what's going on here. I know what I should be doing, but I'm not doing it. I know that God has a true king to rule and reign over me but I want to be king of my own life. I prefer being my own king. But as we see in this text, church, God's will will be done. Whether you're on board with it or whether you're, you're, you're trying to be a, a force of opposition against it, he will win. God's will will be done with or without you. His will will be done. And we don't often think too much about about being in opposition to God's will. Like we're far too sophisticated for that. Like we would never say that we are actually opposing the God of the universe. Rather, we, we put words around it that just tame it down a little bit. We say things like, well, I'm just struggling right now. Yeah, you're struggling in opposition to God. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just wrestling with this stuff right now. No, 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 you're wrestling with the very will that God has for you. Or or sometimes we'll say this, well, I'm just, I'm on a journey. I'm just kind of wandering right now. I'm just not really where I should be. And it's just, listen, it's very binary in the text. You're either for God's will or you're in opposition against his will. It's kind of what the text is laying out. You know what you should do but you're just not doing it. Consider Abner. This is what the text is laying out. And then I think chapter three, verse one actually belongs at the end of chapter two. 
Like if I'm rewriting the chapter breaks, you know, those aren't original to the text. I think I would add that verse one of chapter three to the very tail end to sum it up. So look at verse one in chapter three. There was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. And David grew stronger and stronger while the house of Saul became weaker and weaker. So that's the behind the scenes of all this civil war. Okay, all of these happenings, God is slowly but surely strengthening his chosen and anointed king, David. He's working things behind the scenes to strengthen David, and Abner can oppose all he wants. He can oppose God's will all he wants, but he will be outmatched against the God of the universe. That's what we're seeing in this text. Now, verses two through five get weird. If that wasn't weird, okay? Uh, Verses two through five, I think, get strange because up until now, it seems like David has been a pretty good picture of what, what God said he's looking for, a man after God's own heart. Like David has seemed pretty upstanding as a citizen, as a follower of God thus far. But then the tone of these next couple of chapters grows very ominous surrounding our boy David. So here we go, chapter three, verse two. It's complicated. And sons were born to David at Hebron. His firstborn was Amnon of Ahinoam of Jezreel. And his second... Chiliab, that's a sweet name, uh, of Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And third, Absalom, the son of Makah, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur. And the fourth, Adonijah, the son of Haggith, which is a lovely name for a baby girl if you're looking. And the fifth, Sephiathath, the son of Abital, and the sixth, Ithriam of Eglah, again, another good choice for those of you pregnant with girls, David's wife. These were born to David in Hebron. Now, why did I do that other than to embarrass myself at pronouncing Old Testament names? Why did I read that to you? Because it's complicated. And good baby names. Yes, you're right. This is how God is strengthening David's house. How is he doing it during this civil war? Well, he's giving him sons, heirs. But he's doing those, producing those heirs through six different wives, six women. So what I want to do for just a minute is I want to talk about polygamy. Okay, uh, this is Polygamy Sunday here at Fathom Church. Uh, I had a pastor text me and say, is this a really a big deal in your congregation? And I don't know, all right? Uh, <laughs> But we're going to put this one down once and for all as a community, okay? I want to talk about polygamy. Um, now, here's, uh, we laugh at that, but here's my, my hunch on this one. Uh, I've heard people use polygamy as a reason why they don't trust the Bible. Maybe you have too. People will say things like this. Hey, a bunch of the major characters in the Old Testament had multiple wives. I mean, gosh, David, the man after God's own heart, has multiple wives, What do you do with that? Either this thing cannot be trusted or God allows for polygamy. So what are you going to do with that, pastor? What are you going to do with that? Okay, thank you for asking. I'll tell you. First of all, no, polygamy is not okay. Just to be clear, that'll be on the clip. We don't support polygamy, okay? (laughs) But this is kind of a, I mean, this is kind of, it's kind of a hot topic right now. I don't know if you've, maybe it hasn't hit you yet, but there are TV shows about this, right? Uh, there, are, there is a rise culturally of the acceptance of polyamorous relationships, right? Non-monogamous relationships within marriage. I mean, this is, this is actually, uh, as the sexual revolution crests another hill, this is actually on the forefront of some of our conversations culturally. So let me give you some reasons why the Bible does not support the idea of polygamy. First, we have to define marriage. You have to start with the definition of marriage. And in Genesis chapter two, God created humans, male and female, 
with the purpose that they would marry, the two would become one flesh. And then there's this key verse in Genesis 2, verse 24, that both Paul and Jesus refer to in their teaching ministry. And here's what it says. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. This is the preeminent text about marriage. That there is a male and there is a female and they shall leave their homes, their mother and their father, and they shall hold fast to or cleave to or cling to their spouse. And the two independent fleshes shall become one flesh. That is the picture of marriage in the Bible. And that one flesh reality that reality of marriage as set in Genesis chapter two is profoundly compromised when you add a third person or more into the, into the mathematics. Marriage is compromised. That one flesh union is compromised when you start talking about polygamy. Second reason why polygamy is not biblical. When we read the New Testament, we take how Jesus dealt with the issue of divorce and we can apply it to polygamy. So follow me. Uh, Jesus deals with divorce in the New Testament, even though in the Old Testament, divorce was biblically permitted for God's people. And the way that he handles it shows us a way we might interpret polygamy that was also permitted in the Old Testament, but never uh, approved of by God. So Matthew 19, this is what uh, Jesus says. They said to him, why then did Moses command one to be given a certificate of divorce to send her away? This is after Jesus says, you shouldn't get divorced. They say, well, the Old Testament says that you can. So what do you say to that, Jesus? And Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning, it was not so. That's a reference back to Genesis chapter two and the definition of marriage. So the reason why Jesus says that things that were permitted in the Old Testament are no longer permitted for Christians is because he says the hardness of your hearts, that there were hard hearts. And what Jesus is saying is, I'm going to give you a new heart and I'm going to raise the standards. Your heart of stone will be replaced with a heart of flesh and we're going to level this game up. That's what he says. Now, the reason why Jesus doesn't address polygamy like he addresses uh, uh, divorce is that in his day, by this point, the first century, in Jewish culture, they had already basically given up the practice of polygamy. It just wasn't an issue that he needed to address. Divorce was certainly an issue. Polygamy was not an issue. But, but what I point this out for is that there's a way to understand a tolerance of some act culturally in the Old Testament that, that is now forbidden in the New Testament and beyond. It's complicated. <laughs> it's complicated. Number three, third reason why Polygamy isn't biblical. Uh, every biblical narrative that includes the mention of polygamy is saturated with strife, with, with jealousy, with favorite, favoritism, and even abuse. Like it always leads to problems. Always. The first instance of it is in Genesis chapter 4 with a guy named Lamech who loves to kill people and amass wives. Remember, remember Cain, the first murder? Lamech like boasts. He's like, if, if Lamech's sin is this much, mine is like tenfold that. It never goes well. And then finally, fourth, um, I'm I, to, to the person who's like, well, because it's in the Bible, that must mean it's okay, is actually really poor logic. You ever hear anybody say like, oh, well, that's in the Bible, so that's okay. Not always. There's a lot of things that the Bible talks about that are not okay. Uh, just because the Bible speaks of something, it doesn't mean that it condones it. So we got to turn on our brains a little bit, okay? Th th there are parts of the Bible that are known as prescriptive parts, right? They prescribe something for us to obey. But then there are parts of the Bible that are descriptive parts. They describe things for us to learn from. And good biblical interpretation will work through those differences. 
really, really, between prescriptive and descriptive passages. So here, the Bible never prescribes the taking of multiple wives. Yes, it describes instances of that, and they always go poorly, but it never condones polygamy. So that's polygamy. Feel good about that? You feeling okay? We are, we're, all, we're clear, right? It's not okay. Okay, good. There is a deeper problem for us. The deeper problem for us is, this is David. This is King David. This is the one who God calls, not David calls, the, God calls this guy a man after my own heart. So what do we do with that? Okay, how can the man after God's own heart participate in this? Plus, while I've already told you that polygamy is definitely wrong, uh, it is especially wrong if you're the king of Israel. Like, especially wrong. Deuteronomy chapter 17 has a section specifically about how Israel's kings were supposed to conduct themselves. And Deuteronomy 17, 17 says this. This is about the king. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. Like, if there's an anti-polygamy verse, that's it. For the king. And, 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 and this was clearly stated in God's law because it was common in these times, in those days, for kings to amass multiple wives. First, it was a, a sign of strength. The more wives, the more in your harem that you had, the more strength you had as a king. But also, that's how kings amassed power, how they consolidate, consolidated their reign and even made treaties with other nations. And tragically, David goes along more with the society of his time than with God's prescribed word. The man after God's own heart, David, King David, is here in blatant disobedience to God's law. We just got to be clear about that. Uh, So, remember 1 Samuel for just a second. King Saul was disobedient and he was rejected by God. And now we have King David, who's disobedient. So the question in my mind is this, is David really a man after God's own heart? Or is he not? Like, is David really the king that we're looking for? Well, it's complicated. It's complicated. We'll keep going. This is fun. Not for you, but for me, okay? (laughs) In verses six through eight, uh, while the houses of David and Saul are at war, Abner, remember, this is Saul's right-hand man, uh, he has put Ishbosheth in charge of Israel, but Ishbosheth is really more of a puppet regime. Abner is the strength behind him. Well, Abner wants to make himself even stronger, so what he does is he takes one of Saul's concubines and sleeps with her. That's his move. But Ishbosheth finds out about this, calls Abner out on this. Abner gets ticked off and he makes this vow, which we find in verse 9. So, chapter 3, verse 9. This is Abner's words God, do so to Abner, and more also, if I do not accomplish for David what the Lord has sworn to him to transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul and set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah from Dan to Beersheba. So finally, we know that Abner knows that it is God's will for David to take over the kingship and it to be taken from the house of Saul. That's how we know that Abner knew that the Lord had sworn to make David king. And so he has been actively opposing God, but now he gets a little ticked at Ishbosheth because he likes the concubine. And so he switches teams. He does the traditional, you know, political flip-flop move here. That's what he does, okay? Uh, He switches teams, and he's going to now work to establish David as king over all 12 tribes. And so Abner will reach out now to David, 
call him up on the phone, reach out to David and ask him to make a covenant with him. Make a covenant with me. I'm not gonna be your enemy anymore. I'm gonna help you so that he will help him become king over Israel. And look at verse 13. Here's what we see. This is David. And David said, good, I will make a covenant with you. But one thing I require of you, that is, you shall not see my face unless you first bring Michael, Saul's daughter, when you come see my face. So Michael shows up in this text. Um, This is actually opening up one of the most disturbing moments, I think, in 2 Samuel. Uh, Michael was David's first wife. Not one of the six who he's just been amassing sons with. His actual first wife was Michael, the king, King Saul's daughter. Uh, And it's actually David's first true love. If you remember back to 1 Samuel, he gets to marry one of the king's daughters because he killed Goliath and enter Michael. They fall in love and they get married. But then Saul starts hunting down David. David goes on the run and Saul will take Michael and marry her off to another man. Okay, meanwhile, over the course of 10 years, David marries six more girls, six more women. And now here we are in chapter three, more than a decade after, since he's seen his first wife and David decides, I want Michael back. I want Michael back as my wife. Probably though, not because he missed her. More, I mean, he's got six, okay? I don't know what seven, seven just makes it a number of completion. Like, I don't know what he's going for here. Um, But it's probably, scholars think that it's so that he will strengthen a strategic alliance with the house of Saul by having one of his daughters uh, as his wife. Marrying him or her would give him a political alliance with that house. And so it leads to this unbelievably sad moment in our text. Look at verse 14. Then David sent messengers to Ishbosheth, Saul's son, saying, Give me my wife Michael, for whom I paid the bridal price of a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. That was a gem of a sermon. We'll go back to that. Verse 15. And Ishbosheth sent and took her from her husband, uh, Pal- Paltiel, the son of Laish. But her husband went with her, weeping after her all the way to Baharim. Then Abner said to him, go, return, and he returned. I mean, it's like a heartbreaking scene. Her husband is weeping as the king has demanded, I want Michael back. Uh, What stands out in these verses is how utterly calloused David seems to be toward Michael and her husband. Just doesn't care just does not care. He breaks up a happy home for his own political convenience. And what we're seeing here is that in general, women are pawns for David. They're they're tools to achieve his own ends. And oh, by the way, this is not the last time that David will take another man's wife for his convenience. Because we're just a few chapters from the infamous Bathsheba story, the the Bathsheba incident. And and, and listen, this is why we're spending time here. The Bathsheba incident doesn't come out of nowhere. Okay, it's the fruition of a dark pattern in David's life. David, despite being called a man after God's own heart, has a besetting sin. He has seeds of sin that will ultimately grow and bring him down. So it's my second application from these bizarre passages. First, we said, are you opposing God? Second, this is the second question. Are you allowing sin? Are you still allowing sin? No matter how small it is in your life. Maybe it's a besetting sin like David. But whatever it is, however small it is, the question is, are there seeds of sin that you don't think are that big of a deal right now, but that are planted in you? Are you allowing sin? I've I've asked you like this before. Like if you knew that this year, that this year Satan was gonna take you out, 
Like if you knew that Satan was gonna take you out this year, the question is, how would he do it? Like, you know you. You know what, what propensities or bents you might have. How would you attack you if you wanted to take you down? Would it be a sexual temptation? An affair or pornography? Would it be financial? Would you cheat on your finances? Maybe it's a temper problem or an abuse of power. Gosh, maybe it's, it's bitterness or unforgiveness or even judgmentalism. Like whatever it is, those are seeds. The, the seeds of compromise are present inside you long before the harvest of destruction. Those seeds are present right now, and you might think that's just a seed. But every seed grows and produces a harvest. If you were to commit some heinous sin, like you couldn't even imagine it, like, but if you were to commit something three to four years from now, what would you look back on today as the seeds of that sin? No one just wakes up on like a random Tuesday, eyes open up off their pillow, and they're like, oh, I should wreck my life today. It's never happened. It's seeds that you planted and you pretended weren't there and water and sun and germination and bam, what just grew up in my life? Sin is like, uh, sin is like a cancer. It's not, take the seed analogy. It's like cancer that grows inside of you. And listen, it may start out small, but if you leave it unchecked, it can metastasize until it takes over all of your organs and brings your whole body down. You don't like the seed, you don't like the cancer. How about a pet? You got a, uh, oh, I don't know where our puppy guy left. Oh, there he is. You got a puppy right now, okay? You got a pet. Is there a pet sin that you're trying to keep uh, in control right now in your life. You're trying to domesticate it. You're trying to train it. You're trying to tame it and control it and keep that thing under like a leash. See, I think so many of us, when we, when we got saved, when we started following Christ, we just hoped that the day we started was the day that sin would show itself to the door of our lives. Like it would get out of our lives, but that's just not how it works. Especially, listen, when you make a guest room for it. You put a little puppy bed next to you for your sin. You don't see it as a predator that might bite you in the face. No, 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 it's just a cute pet. It's little and it's cuddly right now. It's not gonna eat you alive. If you knew Satan was gonna bring you down, how would it happen? I challenge you with that. How would it happen? Because if you can identify the seed if you can catch the cancer quickly, right? If you can just murder your pet, maybe don't, but it's, <laughs> it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor. If you can do those things, you have a chance. Not a guarantee, okay? You have a chance. If not, you can expect your own Bathsheba an incident. You can expect it. The Puritan John Owen says it like this. I'll put it up. You must be killing sin or it will be killing you. It's true. We see it in David's life all the way back here. Okay, let me end our section for today. The last few verses, verses 17 through 19, and then we'll close up. Verse 17. And Abner conferred with the elders of Israel, saying, for some time past, you have been seeking David as king over you. Now then bring it about. For the Lord has promised David saying, by the hand of my servant David, I will save my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines and from the hand of all of their enemies. Abner also spoke to Benjamin and then Abner went to tell David at Hebron all that Israel and the whole house of Benjamin thought good to do. 
So in the midst of all of this intrigue and wife amassing and bloodshed and civil war and backstabbing in the midst of all of that, God is bringing about his king. Even using God's enemy, God's opposer to do that very work. David will be king over Israel. And so what's going to happen to Abner and what's going to happen to Joab and what's going to happen to Ishbosheth? Well, that we're going to cover next week. And I just promise you, it gets messy. <laughs> it's complicated. Now, your reaction to this text, as you have now heard it taught and read it, your reaction might be like this. What mine was, well, uh, that's some messed up stuff. <laughs> Like, this feels a little bit more like Game of Thrones than the Bible, does it not? Amassing wives and, like, ripping them from their homes. I mean, all this stuff, it feels very bizarre. And, yeah, it's, it's why I call the sermon, it's complicated. Like, it's complicated stuff. But what all of this reveals is, is that the kingdom of David that he inherits is a, is a big, fat mess. It's a mess, Like, he's not waltzing into uh, taking over for Saul in a perfect set of circumstances. He is uh, walking into a mess. And, oh, by the way, David himself is like a brewing mess as well. Like, his mess is starting to percolate interior. And, And so while David is able to bring a bit of peace as he takes over the kingdom, like a chapter of it, pretty soon his whole kingdom is gonna unravel. Like, it's very short-lived, the rise of David. It's complicated. And then, gosh, David, the man after God's own heart, like the king, the preeminent king of Israel, David, he's complicated too. He's not squeaky clean. He's got a lot of his own mess. But there's a quote from the great reformer Martin Luther that helps me with this. And it says this, God can draw a straight line with a crooked stick. And when I read about these Old Testament kings or men and women who who did great things for the Lord and yet have all of these flaws, all of these sins, all of these issues, it reminds me of this quote. God draws straight lines with crooked sticks. God's will will be done. That's what I said at the beginning of the talk. God's will will be done. And what we find in this text is that while David is a man after God's own heart, listen, he is not the king that we're ultimately looking for. Ultimately, we aren't looking for King David. Ultimately, humanity needs a different savior. And see, that leads us to another king who will be born in the line and house of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. Unlike David, this king will have no compromises of his character. Okay, he won't use his power to amass wives or extort privileges from others. Instead, he will use all of his power to lay his life down, to sacrifice himself for his people and even for his enemies. It's a different king. And then through his death and his resurrection, he will release into this world power that can actually help us answer some of those questions. Are you in opposition to God? The power of the Holy Spirit who resides in every believer can help you with that. Are you kind of still hiding some sin? You've got some sin, seeds, cancers, pets in your life that you need to deal with? Hey, what David didn't have that you have is the Holy Spirit living in you. Through the power of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, he allows for his people now to answer those questions with, I'm not going to oppose, I'm not going to hide sin. I can be, like David, a man, a woman, after his own heart. David is not the king we need. Jesus is. So those questions I pose to you for reflection this morning. Are you opposing him? You soften that blow by saying, oh, I'm just struggling. You opposing him? You allowing sin right now? Oh, it's so cute right now, though. It's not that big of a deal right now. Come to Jesus. Bring those things to him. The 
truer and better king. Let's pray. Lord, we are, are so thankful. God, God let me, I'm, I'm thankful David's a mess. Lord, today I'm first, I'm, I'm thankful that David isn't perfect. Because if he were, then I'd have no hope of living up to his, to his name. Like if David was the king that we were looking for and he did it perfectly, then each and every one of us would fall short of that and be left hopeless. So David's imperfections and yet his response to God's conviction, as we'll see in the text, is what makes him so relatable to us. And so, Father, thank you for this, this king, this imperfect king, David. And Lord, we thank you all the more for how he points us and directs us to the truer and better David, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. And thank you, Father, that, that through a relationship with Jesus, we can be empowered to actually be men and women after your own heart as well. That when we see our mess, our besetting sins, our blatant opposition to your will, that there's hope for us. And that hope is in grace and mercy through the blood of Jesus. Lord, I pray for my friends today where there might be opposition, that there would be repentance. Where there might be sins, uh, seeds of sin in life, that there might be repentance. That you would do your good and right work through your spirit of uprooting those things and setting us on the course to be men and women after your own heart. So Holy Spirit, you're the true preacher here at Fathom. You're the one who preaches to our hearts. So preach to us. Let us learn from Abner. Let us learn from David. Let us choose the narrow path that leads to life. So Lord, we love you. Thank you for this text. We pray it would move us and change us. We pray this in the name of Jesus and by the power of the spirit and all God's people said.